to you. There we go. How's that? Good. All right. So um, as you said, I teach at Stephen F. Austin State University. And this semester, I'm offering my favorite course that I get to teach ever. And uh, it's called Invented Languages. And um, right now, it's being run under our course title 440, which is our advanced linguistics. But I put that side note, soon to be English 437, because I managed to talk administration into making this its own course. It took some convincing, but we will have its own course number, course title, um, next time it's offered. Right, so the course description as it is on the books is that it is an examination of how language works and typical features of world languages in order to construct an invented language. It's also an examination of famous constructed languages including Elvish, Navi, and Esperanto, and of course soon to also include Dothraki and, uh, um, oh, Castathon, I almost forgot the names of the defiance languages, in order to compare features of invented languages to those of natural languages. And then and for the final project, students uh, write a mini grammar of their language. So they work all semester on it. And this semester, I introduced a twist for the students. I actually set them up with clients who wanted an invented language. And so they are, are, they are all working with somebody who is going to be using this for, say, a short story, a screenplay, uh, got a comic book author. Um, and so they're actually working with somebody, and they're giving them specifications to meet. So it's really exciting. And then the references, uh, the required text for the course, are of course Rosenfelder's Language Construction Kit, as somebody had mentioned, you know, like the Bible of Tom uh, And then also a course binder that I produce with glossaries, worksheets, handouts, things that they'll need to make it through the class. And sometimes you do need a lot to make it through such a class. And so the overall course structure is that I have three major areas, and then within those areas I have five sub areas. And so after each sub area, which you're gonna to get to see all five of them, they orally present their work to their classmates to get feedback, to say, here's where I am, where should I be going with this? And after each major area, they present the information to their clients to say, here's how I've updated the language. And they also give a written rough draft to me so that way they can get my feedback, which is of course the most valuable thing they ever get in life. <laughs> uh, and then at the end of the semester, they submit their mini grammar for their language. The general structure is for each um, sub area, I do lecture days for terminology and examples, and then we do in-class activity days, and then after that we have what I like to call the DIY days, where it's, okay, now you do it. And so it's kind of workshop style, I float around the room, answer questions, uh, and they get more specific one-on-one -on -one help during those days. And so for the first major area, I put sounds and writing systems together. And um, so the first sub area then is sounds. And to let, you pick, to let you know where the students start in the semester, because this presentation is gonna focus on the word section. But before I can really talk about the issues that we have in getting to words, I wanna make sure you know where all the students are coming from from the beginning of the semester. And as a, as a side note, um, not all of my students are familiar with linguistics. And so for some of these students, it's the first linguistics class they've ever taken. So for some of them, I say phonetics, and they start just freaking out. They have no idea what I'm talking about. So a lot of this information I have to really monitor for more advanced students who say they've had one of four classes in linguistics, and then those really non-advanced students who are using this as their sole linguistics class uh, for the degree. So within sounds, I do cover IPA and then the anatomy of speech sounds, which is especially important because some of my students are developing alien languages. And if you have an alien who doesn't have the same mouth structures that we have, they need to know which sounds to automatically cross off. Or I did have a student invent some new sounds uh, because her speakers were bears. And she very rightly argued that bears would be able to do things that we can't do <laughs> because they have different anatomy. We also look at typology of sounds across world languages, so those weird patterns like, hey, if your language has an M, it most likely has an N as well. Common phonological processes like assimilation, uh, deletion, and insertion. Syllable structure, those phonotactic constraints of what sounds work in your language together. And then word level things like stress or pitch accent and tone. Now, I've yet to have any students decide to tackle tone, but someday I'm sure they will. And then as far as the expectations of what I expect out of them by the end of the sub-area is to have a working IPA chart, which of course can change. Justification for which sounds they include or don't include. 
and in some sample words just to show how these sounds might come together. Now these words may never get actually used in their language, but they show um, what I like to call how well they play together, you know, the playground of can these sounds be side by side. Once we cover that, we move on to writing systems and look at the types of writing systems across natural language systems. And then of course we also look at some conlanging uh, systems that are available. We talked about the importance of medium. So are they writing on stone? If so, maybe not have really curvy, beautiful script if they're having to carve. Um, or are they using you know, pencils and paper? So, so what types of medium are they using to write? And then of course the importance again of non-human anatomy. You don't have five fingers, your writing may not look quite the same as what ours looks like. And then at the end of this sub-area, they'll have a working writing system. And some, some students do choose just to use the Roman system, which is totally fine, but I do ask them to show me how they're going to represent their sounds with the Roman alphabet. Uh, and then also justification for no writing system at all. Some choose not to have any and have a completely oral culture. And then again, to show these sample big words with things like punctuation and word boundaries included. And these examples, so what you can see on the poster, as David has said, the poster is out there. Um, and also, if you see any students wearing this shirt, we match today, because this is our class t-shirt. And if you ask them to turn around, it's got um, every student provided a phrase in their language, and that's printed on the back of the shirt. Oh. So you can check those out later. I'll model it when I'm done talking. <laughs> so at the end of that area, then, they have a sound system, and they have a writing system that can change, but they have something to start with. They also have these sample fake words to kind of guide how they want their language to sound. Within area one, this usually goes pretty smoothly, even for those students who've never had linguistics before. Once they get over that onslaught of terminology and realize, okay, these things I can relate to, I know what syllables are, I can do this. Um, they have definite things to shoot for because these typological principles especially give them ideas for, okay, if I'm gonna include these sounds, maybe I should include these sounds as well. So they have a target and they can put these targets in charts, which we love, right? But then I hit them with words. <laughs> and from the beginning of the semester, students usually think, hey, making words, that's gonna be the easiest part, right? Because you just throw some stuff together and now it's a word and I tell you what it means and nobody can argue with me because it's my invented language. And so they think it's gonna be easy. As a teacher, I think it's gonna be easy, but now I've offered this class two times and both times I went, oh, we need to talk about developing words a lot more. And so I'm gonna to present to you the types of things I present to my students. I'm gonna show you some activities that I use and then hopefully at the end we have plenty of time for comments and suggestions because I'd really be open to suggestions for how I can better lead my students through this process. And maybe this will also help you think a little bit about your own word making processes. So first, we open up with lecture, as I normally do with each sub-area. Um, making that distinction between morphine and word is very important uh, because morphemes, you know, being the smallest meaning varying, varying units of languages, are not always entire words on their own. So really understanding that little bits of language can carry meaning is important. So I make these major distinctions between those free content, free function, bound content, and bound function markings. I'm not gonna go into it too much here, but I do call them standalone versus needy. So, you know, if you're bound, you're really needy and you just can't, you can't go through life alone. Um, and then we talk about free markings being our notion of word. And so we say for our class, a word is anything that requires a word boundary, however your language marks word boundaries. And that's where I leave it because I say we don't have enough time this semester to argue over any other definitions of work. We have a lot to cover in one semester. And so for this sub area, they're focusing on content words, those like nouns and adjectives and things like that because our grammar section gives them a lot more time for those grammatical words like prepositions, or I should say add positions since not all languages have prepositions anyway. And then we move on to, I call them the, the most popular word formation processes. Uh, just to give them a taste of what's possible. I cover these four and then leave it open if they want to do more advanced things with their language. So we look at affixes, like prefixes, suffixes, those infixes, which of course English doesn't have, but I think a lot of languages should have. Now we have some great infixes. Uh, and circumfixes, which some people just argue is a prefix and a suffix, so it shouldn't be its own category, but we still cover it. Uh, and then we talk about reduplication, the ability to say reduplicate the entire word, like quell to quell quell, 
um, are parts of words like a single syllable like kagir do, kagir dear, or even just um, little parts um, like a, a single sound, like in the kiet uh, tukoyo becoming tukoyo with that reduplicated T in there. And so we talked about some of those different types of reduplication and how they can actually give um, words new meaning by reduplicating those parts. We look at compounds, and of course, when we look at compounds, we have to look at Germanic languages, so I give lots of great examples of just how long compounds can get, and they love that because, you know, in German you get that 80 letter long compound and it doesn't even fit on the board anymore. Uh, and then also on alternations, consonant, like strife, strife, and vowel alternations, like uh, and so we talked about how those different alternations can create new words. And these word formation processes, I tell my students, are really important because it means you don't have to make up new words for every single thing. It means you come up with a process and you come up with one word and then you morph it according to your processes and now you can take this one root that you came up with and have four or five whole words coming off of it or even more depending on how you work it in your language. And so these are very important to remember to develop in the language. And then I also look at some internal and external ways of adding words, like saying, hey, this is going to be a cognate, I want it to be related to another language, and so thinking of cognates, how we can take these words from other languages and incorporate them into our own. Uh, straight up borrowing, if you say they're going to have language content, uh, we're going to borrow these from another language. Uh, whether they come across as looking like armada from the Spanish, the original Spanish armada. Uh, so they look the same, or they may not quite look the same, like a raccoon from the Algonquian not raccoon. And, uh, or we can also say kind of more compounding things like different roots from Greek, the philosophy, and, and incorporating those in. And then we also talk about sound symbolism, which I think is one of our favorite ways to get new words. Um, I love it when I get a lot of water words that are, you know, ha things like that. Um, because it's just really fun, right, to think, what does this sound make, and how would my language speakers be able to reduplicate that with their sound system? Uh, so we do cover sound system and onomatopoeia sound system. How about sound symbolism? And onomatopoeia in order to create new words. And then finally we talk about uh, the differences between say analytic, agglutinating, and fusional languages, which is going to be a lot more important when we get to grammar, but is still important when we talk about developing words, because if you're going to have say an analytic language, maybe all your compounds are gonna have these single morphemes separated out side by side, but then work together still as an overarching compound versus agglutinating, putting them all together with having each morpheme having its own distinct meaning, or maybe you're going to go fusional and say this one morpheme is going to carry three different pieces of meaning um, as I'm building words. And so it's really important, I think, to get an idea of what type of language you're shooting for. And then, of course, you know, modify as you get to grammar and really decide how you're going to incorporate these in, in building words. So after they get lecture, which I guarantee you is the best lectures they've ever had in any college course. Um, after they get this lecture, this introduction, we move on to the in-class activities. And I have four primary ones for the words section, uh, focusing on how we build words in English, looking at what I call the idiomatic compounds, uh, remembering that there is no one-to-one -one correspondence in languages, and then I take them through a four-step process of how you can start to create words. And so for that first one, building English words, what they do, the directions that they actually get are up here on the screen, and what they do is they pick, and I make it very fun, you know, I, I hold up these roots and put them in a mug, pass it around, and the mug says something like, um, you know, good linguists know that, that your time is split 98% playing online and 2% actually researching or something like that. Um, and so they, they pick out their root. For example, one of them is the root, meaning say or speak, and then I ask them to come up with as many words in English as they can that have this root. So things like fiction, dictionary, dictate, dictator, all the way through. And then afterwards, I, I try to stop them and say, okay, how did you create each of those words? Did you have a prefix? Did you have a suffix? Is it a compound? So then they have to think about how all these words are created and their difference in, difference in meaning. So really look at how do we use these word building strategies in English. Um, and so that way, they can say, oh, look, we have this one root, and look at all these possibilities. And that doesn't even begin to, to cover the answers, by the way, that my students come up with. They come up with words that I completely forgot about. Okay. And then we move on to idiomatic compounds, how it's, you know, compounds aren't always literal. You can't always figure out uh, the meanings by putting the two words together, or three words or four words, depending on how long those compounds are. 
And so I give them words in English, like forgive, car, daisy, joke as a verb, yellow and monster, and say, can you please come up with idiomatic compounds to represent each of these words? And so for example, they may say daisy, and one student came up with spring snow, which I think is just beautiful and should be used in a poem. I know we have more than one poet here, so consider that. Um, some people come up with, you know, like little sun, and then one student in particular, kind of very boring, culture said it is a pointless flower, and I'm looking at him right now. Uh, the daisy is my favorite flower, by the way, so we have to have a chat. Uh, but this gets them thinking about, okay, so every word that we have in English, I don't necessarily need that word in my language. Maybe I, I can come up with some new ways of putting words together in my language to create the same concept without just translating that single word. And then we also do this one word to many exercise where it's like, okay, take a word, any word, look it up in a dictionary in another language. So for instance, they may take the word standard and look it up in a German dictionary and you get, you know, Schande, Norm, Muster, Vorbild, Maschstab, Richtlinie, Antwortungen, I almost skipped a whole syllable there. And that, by the way, was about this much of this many in nouns and I didn't even get to the adjective section. So it shows you that, okay, this one standard English can come out in many different ways in German, and then if you take, um, you know, standard from German and look it up in an English dictionary, you get two definitions, standard or level. You take norm, look it up in, a, in an English dictionary, you're going to get norm, or, you know, normative, standard, rule, quota. And so it's really a good exercise to think, okay, do I really need, you know, okay, we have say, does that need to be its own verb, with tell as its own verb, with speak as its own verb, with communicate as its own verb. Or should I put all those meanings together and create one word, but then maybe one of my words can cover, you know, or a few of my words can cover one English word. So again, just remembering there's no one-to-one -one correspondence in languages. And then the four-step process, at the end of this, they're supposed to have about 50 new words in their language, and so they look at a Swadesh list, which is provided in their um, Rosenfelder text. And so I ask them to look at that list and pull out um, lexical words, like all these nouns and verbs, and while they're working on those, I again remind them, think about your speakers and what they actually need, because some of those words on Swadesh list, like Laos, really, I don't need a word for Laos in my language, not yet anyway, they haven't encountered Laos yet. Um, and so think about that, but then also I have speakers who, you know, I have uh, students whose speakers live underwater, and so they're not gonna have half the words on the Swadesh list, but they're gonna need a lot more, like coral and reef and things like that, that would never make the Swadesh list, but are going to be very important for their language. So I tell them, don't just go off the Swadesh list. Really use that as inspiration and move from it. Whenever I say create groups as step one, by the way, what I mean is start putting them into kind of these semantic categories, so then maybe they can all share a root. So things like maybe you group it by color and say green, nature, tree, grass, and leaf all share the same root, and I'm going to permutate them in some way to make new words from it. Uh, maybe say and word go together, a noun and a verb, and they're going to share a group. Uh, and then I also remind them that you don't necessarily have to do this for everything, because for instance in English we have words for tree, branch, root, and stick, none of which share a root, and yet all of which very much have something to do with each other. But then we also get these great long lists like um, communicate, commune, community, communal, communion, communism, and communicable, all of which very obviously share the same root. So it's like, remember you don't have to do this for every single word, but by creating groups you can get a head start on making um, some common words. So that's step one. Step two is to determine if you want any relationships or contact, because that has to be factored in with those cognates and borrowing um, type examples. Step three is actually providing the basic groups, and step four then is using those word building strategies to move forward. So as they do this, this is where we kind of start our workshop style. I float around the room and answer questions. I try to group students according to the types of languages they're working on, so that if they were both, say, working on um, languages that were um, indigenous to America, then I would put them together so they could share roots as, as they worked. And so this is my four-step process. So the challenges or problems that I hear. The first major challenge is the material itself because we move from this more well-defined area that provide an IPA chart, chart, we can handle that, to, yeah, come on, we have words that your language needs, and put, it, put them into your language. Uh, so it's very much a moving target. This is about where I start getting meltdowns in this semester, uh, some mind-blowing activity. <laughs> and if there's too much feedback from the mic, I'm not sure if I'm standing too close or too far away, so I apologize, it's starting to bug. 
Um, and also because developing words is that really great in your work old middle ground between sounds, grammar, and semantics. So you can't talk about developing words without talking about your sound system. You can't talk about words without thinking about grammar, but we haven't reached grammar yet. And you can't do any of that without thinking about the semantics, the meanings of the word. And so it's really all these areas coming together in this one point, and it really does cause frustration, anxiety, and stress. And so some of the major problems that students have reported as I'm floating around the room and ask questions, some of the things I hear over and over again, I don't even know where to start. Because you have these intimidatingly long word lists, the Swadesh list including in Rosenfelder, uh, for example, is just two and a half pages of words. Words, words, words. And so you look at all these and you're thinking, I have to come up with all these in my language. And you know, my professors tell me, no, you don't. You need to pick what's important to your speakers. And then you have to stop and go back and say, well, what is important to my speakers? They also, not all of them have, say, set utterances that have to be translated. Some of the clients did say, here's 15 sentences. I'm going to need these in the language. And so they say, OK, here's the vocabulary I need. Uh, but not all clients did that. So for a lot of students, they had to decide for themselves what words they were going to put in the language. I also hear the, uh, I don't know what words to include in my language, as I just said. Uh, and for this, I call this the word wall, where they started. They say put 10 words into their language, and they're excited. They came up with some great idiomatic compounds. They came up with some great things. And then all of a sudden, they stop. And they go, what else do I need? Uh, and they also, again, just really need to know who their speakers are to kind of break through this word wall to figure out well, what else are they going to need to talk about. And then I hear this a lot. All my words sound the same. <laughs> and they don't like that. They really don't like it when the words sound the same. Uh, and so this is from this kind of stifled creativity, part of which comes from having you know this very short amount of time to come up with a lot of words. And so it's, you're trying to jam all this word making creativity into, say, a week. And as many of you know, this is a process that goes on for a lot longer than a week. And so when you're trying to just create new words, new words, new words, all of a sudden you look down and you're like, hmm. I used about that same group of sounds 20 different ways, and I totally forgot about this half of my IPA chart. Um, also, that's related to the next one, that brain loop, that particular sounds and sequences. You say, I love this sound, and all of a sudden that sound shows up in every single one of your words. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and then also the perceived need to have every possible combination with no overlaps. So they don't like overlap. So making this language, and I, I have to, you know, very lovingly remind them. Think of our wonderful language, English. You know, B. What did I just say? Did I say B E? Did I say B E E? Or am I referring to the letter B? And they go, Oh, yeah, okay. So it's okay to have overlapping sounds. But again, they're really striving for this great glossary. So it's kind of this strive for perfection to get all the words to be completely different. From my point of view, the concerns I have is that I see a lot of similarities to English as they're developing their words not usually in the sounds themselves, but in the fact that, you know, forgetting that one-to-one -one correspondence of, oh, it's in English, so I need it too. And so, again, just really going back to that, don't try to make it just a new way to say English. Really think of it as, what would my speakers do? Where would the importance be? I also see inconsistencies between, you know, their sound section, especially syllable structure, and new words that they're creating which is usually from this unbridged gap between the two areas of, oh yeah, that's right, I did turn in this whole draft about my sound system. Maybe I should keep that information in mind as I'm trying to write words, which of course the sound system can change. I'm, I'm all for change. But the question is, do you remember to go back and change it <laughs> in your documentation of the sound system? And then finally, between words themselves, uh, there tends to be inconsistencies, um, which happens with a lot of uh, scattered handwritten notes. Um, when we invent languages, I've noticed that the majority of us like to write it on paper. And then about 50 sheets of paper later, you forget that one, you already made that word 50 sheets ago. And two, that you had this root that meant this, and now you're using that root to mean some, something else, and it's really starting to get this overlap. Uh, so there's this, start, this sort of lack of connectivity between the day-to-day -day progress on the language and perhaps relying too much on what we all love to do and write out our language. And so here are my suggestions that I give my students, which I'm passing my wisdom on to you. Uh, the first is to see what patterns are available, to really look at languages, whether they're conlangs or natlangs, to see what happens in, in world languages, uh, and take inspiration from those to say, these are patterns that exist, could I use this pattern in my language? But as you discover patterns, as the 
the great Paul Palmer says, uh, don't use them all at once. Because, it, as he told my students, uh, using all the spices in your cabinet to make chili would not taste too great. And so, the same type of thing, saying, hey, I love infixes and circumfixes and compounding, and so all my birds are going to have an infix and a circumfix. <laughs> and so after a while, it just gets to be a little bit too much. Also, don't strive for perfection. It doesn't need to be perfect. No language is. If it is, it's dead. And take breaks between word-making sessions. So let's say you came up with 50 words in a day. Great, let's take a break. Maybe 24 hours later, come back to those words, see if you still like them, and then maybe try to make some more. And then always keep a chart of your sound, your sound system handy. And if you do need to change it, make changes on the chart so you remember to actually update it. But keeping that right beside you after making words, I feel is a very, very important thing to do. And then also keep really good records of what you do. And so I tell my students to use a spreadsheet to your advantage. Um, I'm a Mac user, which apparently some people are already taking issue with. <laughs> um, but I don't like Excel at all. And so I use numbers, which I think is far superior, but you can argue with me on that later. Uh, but any spreadsheet really will allow you to create a glossary that's more easily accessible than handwritten notes. And so first and foremost, I tell them I would use at least four columns, um, maybe only three if you don't have a writing system. And the four columns I tell them to make are to give English counterparts, so the English glosses, a part of speech label, so that way you remember what, that you were using this animal as a, a noun and not something else. Uh, the word in your language, as it would be translated, and then an example of the writing system so you can remember what it looks like. Because once you develop a writing system, it's really easy to forget that you made a writing system. Um, so having that IPA or however you're doing like the sounds of your language, that column is separate from the writing system, I find very helpful. From there, I say remember what you write in the English gloss. Use really good information to remind yourself why you made certain words the way you did. So I have some four arrows as call outs. So for example, um, this is, these are examples from my language, Hyutsa. And so for the word deliver, I'm reminding myself that Zafima is related to both say and carry. So I remember that it has those bases in it. Um, for words like Zafifa, um, it's not just a lie. It's an accidental one, like telling a non-truth because you forgot to you know, get the full story before you started spreading the rumor. Um, versus, say, Zatepapote, which is an intentional lie, and is literally, say, false. So I give literal translations if it's related to basis, and you know a lot of notes for how you would actually use the word. And then words like Zate would cover three English, say, speak, tell. They're all the same. You don't have separate words for them. So I gloss all three words in there, so that way I remember. Uh, and then I have one like Zatio, which is literally fast speak, and that's this kind of conceptual term of you're speaking out of turn and saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, so you can watch that. They, they don't like people who talk too fast. Um, so write really good information when you actually lost the words so you remember how to use them. And then have separate charts for the derivations for all of the different possibilities for your word making strategies. So for example, on verbs, these are just some of the derivations that are possible. So I have like this they suffix that turns a verb into one who does this. The etho versus the oth, which is then used for the verb. And so I have these different nominalized or endings, um, different ways to negate it depending on how it's being used in the sentence. And you can actually also um, put a diminutive onto verbs to say instead of rain, you would put like they eat with the word rain to make it like little rain, sprinkle. <laughs> and then also I keep several, several different charts running at all times. And in numbers, and I'm sure in Excel you can somehow do this too. I haven't figured out how, but you can keep different sheets. And so I actually keep my inf information organized in about eight different ways, so that way I can access it however my brain is working that particular day. Um, so my glossary one is by part of speech and alphabetical by English, so that way I have all my, say, adjectives first, and all my adverbs and my nouns, prepositions, etc. Uh, two, I have all my grammatical charts together, and there's no glosses in there, it's just all the grammatical charts, so that way I remember Oh, you know, here's all my verb endings versus here's all my, my derivations on nouns. And then I have a huge soft English dictionary, so it's alphabetized by all the huge soft words and not by part of speech. And then I have an English huge soft dictionary, which is all of them together without being separated by part of speech. And then I have separate ones for adjectives, nouns and pronouns, verbs, and then adverbs and more, where before each chart begins with all the words in it, I have um, charts on the top for the derivations, the medical, and collections, and then I also 
of any of that four column glossary specific to, to the part of speech. And for me, this is really necessary for me. Maybe not for everybody, but I need to see it in all those different forms, one, so I remember it. And two, so that way all that information is together so I can more easily access it. So I, I really push to my students that organization is the key to success in making words in their language. After they finish words, by the way, just so you know where we're going with all this information, they do cover more fully those morphological language types, how that ties in with grammar, word order, typological <laughs> word order, what are those you know, verb object or object verb correlations across language, looking at things like case, mood, ways to use adverbs, putting together simple sentences. And by the end of this uh, sub-area, they have a description of how their language works grammatically. They have written examples, sentences, and they do have to use um, the lexic glossing methods, so they have to learn how to do linguistic glossing, which I think is their favorite thing all semester. My students are very good. So it's usually about this point in the semester, so we finish this words and grammar stuff, uh, our major area. And then I hear this great sigh of relief from all my students because we get to go to area three, which is meaning, and that is like the reward for having survived the semester so far. And all of them have survived so far. <laughs> and so in the meaning section, which is an area all on its own, we talk about semantic categories, conceptual terms, euphemism, metaphor, taboo, those fun things to put in your language. And so they have to then provide examples in their language, how they would deal with each of these. If they did a good job in the word sub-area, by the way, then all this information is almost all already coded, and so all they have to do is explain to me how they have made the semantic categories already in their words. Um, and so a lot of this is really just kind of formulating in words how their language is working, how it's tied into their culture, uh, their speaker's culture, rather, and um, then adding a little few, a little bit more flair to their language, um, especially in the taboo. I find students love to write about taboos, and um, some students have very, very expensive um, cuss words, <laughs> and <laughs> very creative. <laughs> and so those are usually the, some of the funnest days of student presentations is when they teach other students how to cuss in their language. And so all in all, that's the entire semester, with again, that focus on word building strategies, and now um, I would love to get comments, questions, and or suggestions um, for helping my students through that middle hump and keeping their sanity somewhat <coughs> alive in the creative process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you suggest that they keep their words monosyllabic? Because this is something that I ran into, a problem I ran into, because I started my event in language of 10. So you have something like um, Arabs of Pipale for like cat. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, um, I, know, I, don't, I do talk to them, especially about if you're going to have an analytic language, we need to think about this. And I do have two students, and both of them are here who chose to do a polysynthetic language, and I did talk to them about the importance of, say, choosing shorter words for that, because by the time you string all these together, you wouldn't want to say, you know, and that's like one word to be like the cat. Um, <laughs> and so I do talk to them about, remember, you will be stringing these together, so let's keep this in mind. Um, and I do also try to remind them that common words are usually shorter, so I try to give them those guidelines, but if they choose to have really long words, I say it's your language. You remember that keep good notes and make it work. That, that was a little Tim Gunn there, make it work. <laughs> Thank you. So how have you found um, the in-class sort of work workshop thing? Because I've done something like this before, but just with an individual student. And I was convinced, more or less, that it would be difficult to do, um, to help a lot of students at once, and that I should really sort of uh, stick to, I guess, the rule of two. There will only be a master and apprentice. Uh, and that would be awesome if my university would pay for me to do that. Um, but they don't. Uh, luckily, I have smaller classes. So for anybody who would try to implement this with bigger classes, I would say maybe you need to rethink. Um, my classes for this, for this topic in particular have only been 13 to 15 students. And so that's very small. 
Um, and I hope they stay that size, because if I had 20 students, I think I would be just running ragged on these days. And yet, for me, the workshop days are so valuable because it lets them really dig into the work, have me right there for answering questions, and then it you know slims down, say, on spending eight hours a day outside of class with the students and then trying to you know schedule in with me. Um, so they're really valuable. As the teacher, you do run around and feel like somebody hit you in the head afterwards. Um, I really need a nap after those workshop days because you're answering, you know, you're answering a question for somebody who's, you know, coding a, a polysynthetic language or a language that's trying to pull together Old Norse, Algonquin, and Lakota in one language. And then you turn around and you talk to somebody who's creating a language for a comic book where it's psychically transmitted. <laughs> and, and so you have to stop every once in a while and go, wait, what language is this? Okay. Um, and so it really is a matter of just hitting them and moving on and uh, not literally hitting them. I should have chosen a better verb in English. <laughs> and, um, and just working through it. I think they've been successful. You can ask my students if those workshop days are actually successful. Um, from my point of view, though, they are incredibly valuable. Hard, though, yes. Okay. Um, I actually taught a similar, but not quite as formalized class uh, at um, Berkeley, which is what led to the LCS. Um, so a, a couple of things. Uh, one, I hope that you put your materials online and start videotaping your classes and stuff like that. Uh, it's uh, it's helpful for people who want to do the same thing again, and uh, I've gotten some nice feedback from people who've seen videos of my okay. classes. Um, I'd also encourage adding uh, describing morphosyntax by Thomas Paine okay. as a required textbook. Uh, it's super, super awesome. Um, I required optional. I don't know. I think it's required. Um, <laughs> and uh, as, as it's a required, you want to ask. <laughs> as as a question, I'm wondering: uh, Have your students ever uh, tried to get into sort of uh, languages that are significantly structurally different from English? Like, for example, triconsonantal root systems. Yes, actually, I do have a, a, um, one student working on a triconsonantal root system this semester, and. She's come up with some really, really inventive ways to, to work that in. Um, I do, and I do a lot of different word orders in class because of trying to fit all this into one semester with not having all advanced linguistic students. I only bring up cases that are in the nominative accusative system, and I do offer anybody who wants additional guidance as an advanced invented languages hour outside of class. <laughs> I will more happily cover those more advanced um, systems. Um, so far, only two students out of you know the 30 I've had have taken me up on that. Um, but I do, so they do do a lot of things that are really different from English, and yet it's still, I keep it, I try to keep it modified how much I give to them at once. Yes, I was going to say part of what cited. Um, I would love to take this class. Uh, unfortunately, can't go to Macabre just to take it. Uh, too bad you can't put it online in some form. Is that a possibility? Um, you know, I'll have to see about that. Um, I'm sure it's a possibility. I do, anybody who has asked me, I've shared my materials with them. Um, I'll give you my email. Okay. <laughs> I think we'll give you our email. And, <laughs> perfect. And um, I've also just recently got in contact with um, Angela Carpenter, who teaches, she's a professor at Wellesley, and also offers a class like mine. Uh, where students actually invent languages in the semester, and I've told her that we need to co-author a piece to give advice and also a call to arms, so to speak, to tell college administrators that it is worthy of college class status. Um, something that, there we go, thank you. Um, and so we're gonna um, be working on a piece hopefully this summer, um, and also include things like strategies and why this is something that all colleges should do. Um, but I will happily share my teaching materials. Uh, you had uh, asked for potential suggestions on how to get over that middle hump, I believe you called mm -hmm. it. Um, one thing I've noticed that seems helpful to a lot of conlangers who are out there on the web, to, you know, inventing their languages and sharing them, is when we do conlang relays, we're forced to, uh, to confront a text that our language isn't prepared for in terms of either vocabulary or a particular Oh dear, I have no causative structure. And so it forces us to introspect and 
create one out of word and that sort of thing. And I'm wondering if the same principle might be helpful for your second hump that your that your students are having trouble with in in the way in sort of like this. If you were to create a, a corpus of sentences, English sentences, for them to um, translate mm -hmm. and show how those each of those sentences is translated in, say, five or ten different existing conlangs. Right. And you could go onto the conlang mailing list uh, or something and say, hey, I need, I need these ten sentences translated into as many conlangs as possible with interlinear analysis so that I can understand your morphology, right. whatever. That would then give you a corpus of sentences to use in your, in your class with a variety of conlangs, some polysynthetic, some analytic, some showing massive case structures, some, some showing, you know, all kinds of variety, not to mention metaphors, conceptual metaphors, idiomatic structures, all designed to show the, the variety of how conlangers tackle the same problem. And um, because one of the things you mentioned, I noticed, was that some of your students run out of steam. Oh dear, what word do I need next? Yes. Well, th this kind of exercise solves that problem for them by saying, what, I, I need a word for this, because the sentence requires it. And so I think maybe that principle might be helpful to you. I really like that idea. Thank you. Um, I, I just like to second that, that. I think that's a really good idea. Uh, one thing that you're sort of conflating in your class is the kind of culturing the con langing, and if you set up for them sort of a con culture, uh, at least uh, broadly speaking, so that they can reinterpret it, mm -hmm. but then say, you know, here are some things that you need to communicate, right. figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. I think that that's an excellent idea for getting over that hump. Also, a question from RC Christoph asks, uh, what reasons do your students give for taking the class? Uh, <laughs> we could always give them the mic. Um, actually, that would be great. They're all wearing matching shirts back here. Um, <laughs> that would be great if we could give them. It's, I, I think I know what the reasons are, but I'd rather hear it from them. Um, I'm a Spanish major in a linguistic class. Um, I just recently started taking uh, ling linguistic classes, and uh, I took one, and I had to take the rest of them, so it's on here. <laughs> you got the book. Yes. Um, I'm also a linguistics monitor, and um, I, she put up the, uh, the class on one for a uh, spring semester, and I was like, I, it, it just intrigued me, so I just had to take it, and I don't regret it. <laughs> uh, well, I needed my linguistics credit for my English major, <laughs> and they told me I should take it, but I'd never taken linguistics, and I was super scared. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a lot of fun, and it was really good. The best class I've been in college. Aww. Aww. Um, I finished my minor last semester, but when I knew that this class was happening, I had to take it. <laughs> um, because everybody who took it last, the, the last time it was offered, loved it, talked it up so much, and it just sounded like just such an awesome opportunity, and it has been. really a question about your experience with the class, and that is, I noticed you said some of your students um, had bears talking or <laughs> were people, and this brings up uh, the, the question of semantic categorization and semantic primitives, and I know that on the web a lot of commentators create alien races, and I read those languages to me, they seem like con cultures of human people, not really languages that a completely inhuman race might come up with. And what I'm asking, and I know that we're talking about semantic primitives to be a whole uh, conference all on its own, and I'm not wanting to get into that. I'm just wondering how deep have you seen your students get into the, 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 the philosophical questions? 
I would like to bring up one student in particular who's not here, so we can talk freely about his language. <laughs> <laughs> so his alien race. Um, now, first of all, because the the clients are requesting that humans be able to see it and not freak out, so they do have that element of humanism to them, even though they are aliens. But that is requested by the clients, so that way human speakers can see the languages and realize it is a language. Um, but one one person in particular is working with um, an alien race who time travels, and so his most complex system is this tense. Because um, when the rest of us were choosing between two to five tenses, um, he had, I believe, altogether 11. Um, and it's because there's this absolute timeline that just keeps going from day one of, you know, whatever to infinity day, and it keeps going in a straight line. And then there's your personal timeline because you're a time traveler. So my past, maybe yesterday, I traveled to 2025. So on the absolute timeline, it's the future, but in my personal timeline, it's yesterday. And so then there's also the tenses that pull these two together in a relative tense timeline. Um, I had to take several Excedrin to get through his last draft, <laughs> which he did not supply for me. Um, and so I do get students who really go deeply into this and think it through and provide really, really neat observations about their languages. And again, tying it to the culture that, in this case, the, was supplied to them mostly by their clients, but they then, then still had to come up with um, ways to, to actually put it into the language. Um, and so they do really do some intriguing things, um, but yes, there is a limit to it because it still needs to be recognizable by human um, ears, which it wouldn't necessarily be if we actually found an alien language. And speaking of alien languages. <laughs> um, well, it's kind of really, actually, so I, it's kind of a mundane suggestion, but um, <clears throat> I found it really interesting and useful to build a, a spreadsheet, and numbers will be fine, but Excel is also allowed, um, <laughs> yes. of all the legal syllables in your language, especially if you're going to have a lot of monosyllabic words, because if you have really strange other consonant clusters and whatnot, your English-speaking brain or your Spanish-speaking brain is not going to be used to coming up with those. But if you go back and then view them visually, it can actually turn this kind of burdensome experience into something that's quite fun because you discover all of these words right. that are allowed to exist in your life. And actually, the Navi community um, has a communal process for submitting words and everybody collaborating. And one of the very first things that happened was that list of 8,000 plus legal syllables got created. Um, the function is called concatenate in your spreadsheet, and um, it's quite useful for getting all however many thousands or tens of thousands of mm -hmm. I have to start taking notes here. So I'm not text messaging, this is actually my note. <laughs> <laughs> On my website I have several pearl scripts for um, handling highlighting text. Um, there are two of them that will generate words given a particular tactic. One of them by John Cowan, if I remember right, um, generates all the possible um, uh, words or syllables that match a particular pattern. Another will create 